Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we're going to have quite the mix for you, but we're going to kick things off with something rather exciting as we could be seeing the next big breakthrough in chip technology. So what I actually have here is something from researchers from Princeton who have discovered a bit of a breakthrough that could significantly increase performance while reducing energy usage and what we have here is a prototype chip now prototype is definitely something that word should be very very important with this whole particular segment but this particular chip uses a technique called in-memory computing which reduces load on a system's processor now at the moment cpus typically work in stages but essentially they, they fetch the instruction from the ram decode the instruction and so on and so forth so obviously the processor needs to continually fetch that data from a device's memory and this particular technique will allow those tasks to occur within the memory itself paving the way for quote greater speed and efficiency so obviously the cpu is just being relied upon a lot less to just fetch those instructions so as you might imagine this does also have improved performance of particular chip obviously and consumes less power as well now unfortunately we don't have exact performance numbers as to how much faster this particular piece of chip tech actually is they have of course done various tests within their lab and they have said that they've been able to reach performance levels that are quote 10 to hundreds times faster than the chips currently out there but there is a caveat naturally as you might expect this particular design that they're testing at the moment at least is intending intended should i say for machine learning or deep learning inference to be more specific now obviously this doesn't mean that this particular piece of hardware can't then be used and applied to other purposes we have seen just that we have seen stripped down versions of you know things meant for ai meant for data center meant for all that sort of stuff come to the consumer level with some of the cool tech still in tow, but obviously nerfed in comparison to that of its original intention. So we could still see this come to, say, smartphones or other devices, but obviously it's not going to be anytime soon, because not only is this, again, particular design meant for machine learning, it is a prototype. So it's going to be a while before it's even ready for prime time, and then again it'll be a while before this particular design and technique is applied for a CPU that you might be interested in as a gamer, or even as just someone who is a professional, you know, perhaps you do rendering work, that sort of thing. But it's still really, really cool. I love this sort of stuff. These new steps in technology are really, really cool, and this one seems actually really promising as to a way to sort of step past the boundaries of Moore's Law, which is obviously something that has been quite the topic of discussion as obviously we've been pushing the limits of Moore's Law for quite some time. So anyway, that's me done for this particular topic. Let's move on to something a, a bit less hopeful as we have yet more Spectre and Meltdown flaws discovered. So unfortunately, some researchers, some of which actually include those who were behind the original Spectre and Meltdown discovery, have published a paper detailing a further seven variants of this particular uh, security vulnerability and this expands to speculative ex execution to a form they are now calling quote transient execution and they tested this against intel arm and of course amd and unfortunately they found that all three processor types were vulnerable to selected attack types now they said quote we also systematically evaluated all defenses discovering that some transient execution attacks are not successfully mitigated by the rolled out patches and others are not mitigated because they have been overlooked hence we need to think about future defenses very carefully and plan to mitigate attacks and variants that are yet unknown but this particular point that the current microcode updates and obviously the various other techniques that are out there to kind of protect and fight against Spectre and Meltdown, they're saying, okay, it doesn't work against all of them and some of them it doesn't work at all. Um, Intel are actually refuting this, which is obviously quite critical to say the least, that this seems to be a topic of a little bit of contention between the two groups. So what did Intel actually say? They said, quote, the vulnerabilities documented in this paper can be fully addressed by applying existing mitigation techniques for Spectre and Meltdown. Protecting consumers continues to be a critical priority for us, and we are thankful to the teams at Graz University of Technology, Emek Distronet, KU, Leuven, and the College of William and Mary for the ongoing research. Now, 
The full paper is going to be in the description below this video. It is a rather huge PDF file, but it is going to be there for your perusal. It's 16 pages long. So if you're at all interested in the real nitty gritty of what's going on here, it is going to be there for you. But uh, buckle in for a bit of a read. But the long story short is unfortunately seven more variants have been found. And at least according to these researchers, the current mitigations are not fully effective against all of these. But Intel seem to be disagreeing with this, so... Who to believe? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a researcher. Like just, just looking at some of these things in this paper just makes my brain hurt. So <laughs> anyway, in all seriousness, let's move on, shall we? Now, after all that PC talk, which of course is kind of what we're here for, or at least primarily, we do have a little bit of a trip over to Console Town as we have a couple of things from Sony. Now, you may recall that very, very recently Sony came out of nowhere for some and confirmed that yes, they are going to be missing E3 for the first time in years next year. But for those of you who browse Reddit, you probably saw the post from Runethic Cookie, who basically claimed that, yep, Sony are not going to be at E3 2019. So the fact that this was confirmed pretty much a day later, obviously did raise some eyebrows as to his sources, or her sources indeed. So this particular insider, who was correct on one thing, has now been talking about some other stuff which while we shouldn't believe wholesale just because it was correct about this one particular thing we should definitely pay more attention to this particular comment so he's been actively talking recently about the upcoming ps5 and the ps vr 2 so according to him the ps5 is going to be revealed in 2019 and obviously this is not going to be at E3 because Sony have officially confirmed they're not going to be at E3. So this is probably going to be like a PlayStation conference specifically, maybe around the time of E3 or not. Obviously we revealed the PS4 Pro, it was nothing to do with E3. We saw its own PS4 conference just for that. So they're going to be having their own event just for the PlayStation 5. And apparently Sony are going to be targeting a March 2020 release date, but we could see that push to November but the key takeaway from that is 2020, which I would actually peg as pretty sensible, to be honest, regardless of whether he has in inside sources or not, I don't know, obviously. Um, I would say 2020 is a logical time, because obviously 2019 is too early for a lot of reasons. The PS4 Pro is not that old, obviously they need to announce it for at least a few months in advance to give people time to prepare, save up, all that sort of stuff, and obviously announce some games build up hype, marketing, all that sort of stuff. So 2020, I feel, is the most logical time. But obviously, we should still take everything he's saying with a pinch of salt. Now, he did actually talk a little bit about what the PS5 is actually going to be capable of, and it's going to be capable of running a stable 4K at 60 frames per second, and they're going to be having a Ryzen 8 core inside itself. Now, I want to kind of dig into that comment a little bit. Now, do they mean eight cores with no SMT? So eight cores, eight threads, or are they confusing cores and threads? So it's four cores and eight threads, or is it 16 threads and eight physical cores? We, we just don't know. It's just, just saying eight cores is like, okay, do you mean that? Or do you mean eight threads? Do you mean eight physical cores with no SMT? Like, help me out here, basically. I need more information. So we should, even if that's true, Take that with a pinch of salt and be like, okay, more information, please. So, let's not forget the PSVR 2, as I did also mention that mere moments ago. Apparently, it's going to have a processing box built into the PS5 itself, the PSVR 2, that is. And the PS5 is going to have a built-in camera for tracking and also a new PlayStation Move controller. Now we're going to be seeing some late PS5, sorry, PS4 games make their way to the PS5, which would make perfect sense. So these would be games like Death Stranding, Last of Us Part 2, Ghost of Tsushima, and other things that are going to be coming out late in the PS4's life cycle are going to eventually come out the PS5 as well, which of course makes perfect sense. Apparently we're also going to see Red Dead Redemption 2 um, come out in PS5 as well. Despite the fact that he was correct about the E3 thing, we should take everything here with huge, massive quantities of salt. But again, the release window makes sense. We've heard rumours about Zen for the PS5 for quite some time. We didn't see a confirmation of core count, but we had reports from Semi Accurate that we're going to be seeing Ryzen inside it. And then we had a report from Forbes that are going to be seeing Navi inside as well. So this is kind of lining up with previous comments from people. Anyway... 
The next Sony item on our list is actually regarding the huge amount of consoles they've actually sold since its launch. And these were comments made by Eric Lempel, the Senior Vice President of PlayStation Worldwide Marketing, and he revealed that Sony has sold an insane amount of consoles, and the exact amount is 86.1 million consoles. And despite that staggering number, that still only makes it the sixth best-selling console of all time. So, yeah. Sony are obviously pretty damn happy with how well the PS4 has been doing this generation, but obviously as this generation is inevitably coming to a close, if it's 2020 or 2021, it's it's going to be the next couple of years where we say goodbye to the PS4 and of course the Xbox One and the Xbox One X. We might see backwards compatibility on some of them, of course, we don't know what's going to be happening now. Obviously the, back, the lack of backwards compatibility was definitely something that um, Sony did miss out on and obviously Microsoft did eventually add it to the Xbox One. So, regardless of what's happening there, as amazing as the PS4 has done, we're obviously all looking forward to the next generation now, seeing what they have in store for that, in terms of specs, games, all that sort of stuff. Microsoft have not been shy about the fact that they have been buying studios left, right and centre, because they are very, very aware of the meme surrounding the Xbox One X that there's no games for it. Obviously, there's not literally no games for it, but you know what I mean. So it's going to be interesting. I think the race is definitely on for the next generation. Obviously, Sony has taken the trophy well and truly for this gen. But obviously, next one, anyone's game. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.